Um, exemplify this because the Kurds or Kurdistan, the Kurdish regions, border a number of countries, Turkey, Syria, Iraq, Iran. And so, so any Kurdish problem will bring in all these different countries. So that is, I think, um, exemplary of the kinds of problems the Middle East uh, is facing today. Uh, what is uh, good for us uh, in this problem is that we are able to assemble experts on these different countries, Turkey, Iran, um, Iraq. And we also are developing expertise in thinking about a set of countries together, a region, a trans-region, as a set of countries, as a network. And with this sort of analysis, we want to apply this sort of broader view to um, look at any problem in any country that appears in the Middle East. So this is a line of analysis and research we are developing in the Middle East Institute. And so the, the, the Kurdish problem today is, to me, a um, very good example for doing this sort of analysis. So we're happy you're here today, and we will uh, try to give you a sense of what this sort of analysis can do. We have uh, Dr. Fanar Haddad, who is a senior research fellow at the Middle East Institute. He is an expert on Iraq. He's written a lot about the Iraqi problems, especially sectarianism. Um, we have uh, Dr. Sirkan Yolajan, who is a research fellow at the Institute. He's an expert on Azerbaijan and Turkey, but also on the uh, long-standing relations among Turkey, Russia, and Iran from the past to the present. And we have Dr. Ahmad Hashim, who is a great expert on Iran, uh, but has also expanded his work to terrorism. He has a book coming out on the Tamil Tigers, I believe. No, I Sorry? The ISIS. The ISIS. Oh, ISIS. Sorry, on ISIS. And so I think we, we have a good combination of uh, regional country expertise and people who can basically helicopter around. So we'll have each one of them speak for 15 minutes, and then we welcome questions from you. Thank you. Fanar. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. Um, and good afternoon, everyone. So I'm going to try to give a bit of uh, background to the issue, and then I want to get into, is this me? This is not me. It's me. Oh, that is you. That's me. OK. Uh, right, so I'm going to give a bit of background about the issue, and then I want to get into sort of the drivers behind, uh, I'm not even touching it, Ronald. <laughs> it's I got a mind of its own. There. Uh, yeah, so I want to get into the drivers behind the call for the referendum last month and also the drivers behind the reaction to, to the referendum and what's been going on over the last few weeks. Um, so very quickly, I'm going to go through this. The area shaded orange, that's the Kurdistan region in Iraq, uh, administered by the KRG, the Kurdis, uh, Kurdistan regional government. Uh, this is the officially recognized KRG, as in the Iraqi constitution of 2005, to which the Kurds are, of course, signatory. The areas shaded blue and pink, uh, these are disputed territories. Uh, these are claimed by both Erbil, the regional capital of Kurdistan, and Baghdad, the federal capital of Iraq. Uh, now, these disputed territories, according to the constitution, come under the jurisdiction of the federal government in Baghdad. So legally, they are to be administered by Baghdad. And according to the Constitution, uh, that administration continues until a series of measures are set in place, culminating with a referendum on these areas to decide their permanent future. None of these steps have taken place since signing the Constitution in 2005. None of this has actually happened. It's just been ignored and allowed to fester. The most uh, important uh, or most contentious uh, area of the disputed areas is, of course, the city of Kirkuk, which is marked out there. This is a major city. It's a multi-ethnic city. It's a oil-rich city. Um, and it's the most contentious of the disputed territories. Now, in 2014, you'll recall ISIS swept in 
Mosul fell, the Iraqi state essentially collapsed. So what happened was, in that collapse, as the Iraqi security forces essentially disappeared, Kurdish military forces <coughs> moved out of the Orange area and made a claim, uh, tried to claim the disputed territories. So something like this, the dots of line would be uh, uh, sort of the Kurdistan proper, so to speak. In 2014, as the Iraqi state collapsed, they took the advantage to sort of move in and uh, establish facts on the ground, so to speak. So that's a bit of background for you. Now, come 2017, and I should say that with that expansion, as far as the Kurdish leadership were concerned, this was a fact on the ground. There was no going back. As far as Baghdad were concerned, there was no way in hell they were going to let this stand. Uh, so this was always sort of the bullet that everyone's dodging. Well, the bullet hit in, in, in uh, September, I beg your pardon, uh, when the referendum on Kurdish independence was called. Now, this was always going to be contentious. It's not unprecedented. It's not the first referendum they have on this. Um, but what made it especially contentious is that they held the referendum in the areas that had been taken since 2014, in the disputed territories. So, for example, holding the referendum in Kirkuk was almost, it almost seemed like intentionally designed to be provocative. Uh, so that was uh, something that made the referendum particularly, uh, particularly uh, problematic. Now, to understand the referendum and to understand the conflict since and the reaction to the referendum, I think there are three levels of analysis uh, that we have to keep in mind. The internal, sort of internal Kur Kurdish politics, internal Iraqi politics, uh, the national level between the two entities, between Erbil and Baghdad, the power dynamics between them, the deals struck between the two, the power relations between the two, and the third level would be the regional or the international level as well. And I don't think you can divorce one from the other. Uh, and I will say that the reporting on this crisis has been appalling so far, particularly in the American press, has been absolutely appalling, partly because uh, there's no room for having three levels of analysis. Uh, it's you know the plucky Kurds who are um, <laughs> oppressed, history's victims, taking their rights back from these sort of overbearing, anti-American, uh, shady uh, Shia Arabs. And that's about as far as the, as the narrative goes, with a heavy undertone of Iran versus an American ally. But it's not that simple. And as much as I sympathize with uh, the Kurdish struggle for statehood, it's not simply a case of the Kurds calling, you know, trying to get their state through this referendum. When the referendum was called, to understand what was going on with this calling of the referendum, yes, on the one hand, there is the long historic struggle for Kurdish statehood. But then there's something else going on, and that is internal Kurdish politics. So what I've got up here for you is the main Kurdish parties, uh, particularly the first three see on the top left, the KDP under the uh, uh, leadership of the Barzani family, who also controlled the uh, presidency of Kurdistan, You've got the PUK under the Talibani family, uh, which on the map is shaded green. And then thirdly is the Goran movement uh, that's shaded blue. Now, the referendum was called by Masoud Barzani, the head of the KDP, that's the area shaded yellow, and the president of the Kurdistan region of Iraq. Now, no Kurd does not dream of statehood for, for the Kurds. It's their most cherished dream. However, when the referendum was called by Masoud Barzani, his political opponents, his political rivals in the PUK, in Goran, and others, on the one hand, as I said, they're very keen on every, every Kurd sort of dreams of statehood. On the other hand, they suspected that this might be Masoud Barzani using that which is dearest to Kurds to further his own political interests and to outflank his rivals. Um, and a bit of background might be needed here. Uh, so Barzani's uh, tenure as president ran out in 2015. He has refused to step down since. And in fact, not only has he refused to step down, he has suspended parliament between 2015 all the way until last month. Parliament was just suspended. The representatives from Goran, who are an opposition movement, were not physically prevented from entering Erbil, the uh, regional capital. So there's a lot of sort of political rivalry going on within Kurdish politics. Uh, so yes, there's the historic struggle for statehood, but there's something else going on. 
Uh, and that takes us to that level of analysis, as I said, the internal politics uh, within uh, Kurdistan. So if you go through them really quickly, internal politics, you had a divided house. Uh, in terms of relations with Baghdad, uh, Baghdad was adamant that they were adamantly against this. In terms of the international uh, level of analysis, the Kurds had no friends in this referendum. All their friends told them, we are against this, do not do this. Uh, in fact, the only word of support they got was from the Israelis, but those are just words. They're not going to back them up with anything. So that's with regards to the referendum. Now, to understand the reaction to the referendum, again, if we're looking at it from Baghdad's point of view, again, those are those three levels of analysis. In the media, most of the coverage has just been focusing on Iran, uh, completely writing out Iraq from the, from the story. Uh, it's just sort of an Iranian attack on an American ally, the ally being uh, Kurdistan. This is far, far too simplistic. Yes, the Iranians have interests in Iraq and in what's going on in northern Iraq today. So too do the Turks, so too do the Americans, and more importantly, so too does the prime minister of Iraq sitting in Baghdad. So I see it more as a convergence of interests rather than Iran acting as a puppeteer, which is kind of what you see in the, in the American media uh, over the last couple of weeks. So from the prime minister's point of view, sitting in Baghdad, this referendum placed him in an impossible position. He had to respond, particularly given that it was being held in, in disputed areas like Kirkuk. He had to respond. There was insurmountable political pressure on him to continue the wave, uh, to continue riding the wave that he has generated in the successes in the fight against ISIS, um, and to sort of carry that forward to, so to speak, teach the Kurds a lesson, which is a very popular thing in Arab Iraqi circles. So again, you've got the three levels of analysis, internal Iraqi politics placing that pressure on the prime minister. You've got Kurdish divisions in Kurdistan that gave the Iraqi prime minister a ready ally in within the Kurdish region. And it's clear that at least a branch of the PUK has been sort of hedging its bets and, and uh, uh, signaling that they're prepared to work with Baghdad. And finally, the regional international level, uh, a very ironclad consensus against uh, what um, uh, what, against the referendum and all for Baghdad. So what has happened is here, um, you'll see, so the orange line is the line before, uh, is where the Kurds were before, uh, uh, um, before the ISIS onslaught. The black is, is uh, Iraqi troops. Anything that goes beyond that orange line is contentious in the sense that you're, you're going into, you're going beyond just recapturing the areas that the Kurds took in 20. 14. So as you can see, it's already gone more uh, 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 sort of controversial, and this is already out of date. Uh, the, the Iraqis have moved further, further north. Um, I'll end. I think I'm running out of time, uh, so I just want to say something about going forward. Uh, it seems that Baghdad's got the upper hand because of regionally and locally and between the two entities, they've got the upper hand. Uh, a lot of Iraqis, if you go on Iraqi social media, uh, sort of uh, quite an ugly jingoistic nationalism, uh, a lot of schadenfreude against the Kurds, as in, you know, we taught the Kurds a lesson, that kind of uh, thing. And it's been extremely popular, an extreme popularity boost for the prime minister. I think the Arabs are celebrating a Pyrrhic victory. Uh, this is nothing more than delaying yet another crisis, delaying yet another uh, flare-up at some point in the future. Uh, I was hoping actually that in 2014, given the magnitude of the threat posed by ISIS, I had hoped that that moment would have uh, allowed for a reset in Arab-Kurdish relations and a total rethink. It didn't happen. I was hoping that something like that could happen now. Again, it hasn't happened. I don't know when it will, I doubt it ever will, but what needs to happen is a complete fundamental reformulation of the relations between Baghdad and Erbil and in my ideal world, it would look like something like this. Firstly, it would be predicated on an acknowledgement by both sides that they need to separate. Now today, you don't have to convince the Kurds of the merits of separation, but you have to convince the Iraqis and everyone else in the neighborhood. But I think you need to bring the Iraqis on board. There needs to be a, a, a recognition that it's in both sides' national interests, respective national interests to separate, rather than continuing this pseudo-colonial 
weird setup that, they, that they've got going now. So you get the desire for separation on both sides. Secondly, as I said, you don't have to convince the Kurds of the benefits of separation, but you do have to convince them to moderate how they frame that. And I would say that should begin with decoupling Kirkuk from Kurdish independence. Kirkuk, the Kurds refer to it as our Jerusalem. Well, we know how the original Jerusalem panned out, so that's not promising. Uh, if you divorce Kirkuk from Kurdish independence, then you can actually start really negotiating about Kurdish independence. As long as Kirkuk is intertwined with that, all bets are off, in my opinion. So that's the second tall order, is to convince the Kurds to view the two separately. If you manage to do that, then Kirkuk, I believe Kirkuk can never be really held in a sustainable way, unilaterally by one side. So what better thing to do than to uh, bring in a form of joint administration between the two entities, whether they're two separate states, consociationalism, confederalism, whatever, but a joint administration of Kirkuk and a joint exploitation of Kirkuk's natural resources. Just as Qatar and Iran exploit the same gas field, just as Iraq and Kuwait exploit the Rumela oil fields, let these two entities exploit, jointly exploit uh, Kirkuk's oil under UN auspices, perhaps. And finally, Iraqi nationalism, a big hurdle, uh, and uh, there, are, there are a lot of emotional hurdle, hurdles in this, one of which is Iraqi nationalism. I would say to Iraqi national, nationalists that it's perhaps better for you to think of what I'm proposing not as you know, the traumatic breakup of Iraq, but no, as the strategic engineering of a friendly northern neighbor. Because otherwise, you are constantly having to keep this significant population, about 17% of the whole, constantly keeping them in within Iraq. And this is a 17% that is allergic to the very idea of Iraq. So it does both sides many favors if they can get over the uh, uh, emotional uh, uh, hurdles and get on the same page with regards to this. And were they on the same page, they'd have an easier job bringing in the regional powers on board. Because as I said, there are three levels of analysis, and all three have to be addressed, including if they were going to separate. I think I'm over my time, Prof. I think you're fine. OK. Well, uh, I will end here anyway, I think, um, and let my colleagues have a go. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fana. Thanks for a very clear and sharp analysis and presentation of the situation. And um, I'm happy to see that you also go one step forward to look at the future and even to propose uh, how to go about dealing with it. So thank you very much. We'll, uh, that will give us a lot to uh, discuss. Uh, we now have Sirkan Yurajan. Thank you. Um, I will take the discussion out of Iraq a little bit and carry it toward the north, uh, I will approach the issue from the perspectives of uh, Iran, Turkey, and Russia, three states that have been deeply involved in the Kurdish uh, crisis or Kurdish uh, uh, situation, both in Iraq and in Syria. Um, let me preface my talk with the reminder that these three states um, were once the imperial neighbors, and they they, they shared uh, peoples and societies across their borders, such as, how do you use this? Just this, yeah. Such as the Kurds, um, you see the Azeris, partly overlapping, and of course the Armenians. Now, uh, Armenians are largely out of the equation today uh, due to past tragedies, but uh, they used to be a very important link that connected these three powers. Now, historically, these three states used these uh, populations that are spilling across their borders to basically stretch their arms and legs into the, to each other's backyards and meddle each other's affairs. And such meddling at times produced even states over the course of the 20th century. For example, it was thanks to the Turkish uh, support in the Caucasus in the Russian backyard that the first Azeri state was uh, established in 1918. And it was, again, due to the, thanks to the support of the Soviets that the first Kurdish state uh, was established in Iran's backyard, actually within Iran, uh, called the Republic of uh, Mahabad. 
and uh, let me yes. So you see to the left, uh, Kurdish Republic of Mahabad was uh, I think uh, established in December two thousand uh, December nineteen forty five and lasted only a year. And uh, it's it's an interesting fact that uh, Mesut Barzani, the leader of uh, uh, Iraqi Kurdistan was born there, and his father, Mullah Mustafa, was uh, the defense minister of that state and uh, the leader of the Kurdish army. And Barzani today often uh, reminds to, the, to his audience that uh, he was born in a Kurdish state and he wants to die in one. <laughs> uh, so even though this was a, a very short-term, uh, short-lived state, it had a legacy in terms of being a reference point historically for Kurdish uh, aspirations uh, ever since. So in a way, and this the state that Barzani is referring to is basically established by the Soviets. It was also known as a Soviet puppet state uh, by some. So the Russian involvement in the Kurdish affairs is nothing new. Uh, this northerly dimension that I'm talking about has been part, has been integral to the Kur to Kurdish modern history uh, from the from the very start, uh, I would say. With that reminder, um, I want to I want to be, uh, basically remind you again that these sorts of histories are not lost on the leadership uh, and the, on Kurds, but also uh, on the leaders of these three states that I'm talking about. There's an overall awareness of the importance of, of these borderlands and old frontiers where uh, states can articulate with these stateless networks and flex their muscles beyond their borders and test the power of each other as well. Uh, when, when the state network interaction or engagement works well, then it creates new political and economic hinterlands for these powers. We saw that in the aftermath of the US invasion of Iraq, right? When Iraq became uh, part and parcel of uh, economic and political sphere of Iran. In the same way earlier, uh, when after the Soviet collapse, uh, former Soviet <laughs> territories in the Caucasus and Central Asia became Turkish backyard, uh, where Turks uh, brought in a lot of uh, projects, infrastructure projects, uh, business, and education. <coughs> and <clears throat> more recently, of course, we see this in a more chaotic fashion in Syria, where these three states, and of course many others, were locked in for years. Um, and Syria is, of course, part of a series of conflicts that have been happening since the Cold War's end. Right? Um, Including the, including the one in Bosnia, in the Caucasus, in Afghanistan, where regional and global powers uh, faced each other in different configurations. Each of these frontiers carried lessons for the states and the networks that were involved, who then carried these lessons onto the next frontier and the next encounter they had. Um, so each frontier and encounter, in a way, teach these states lessons as to whom to trust, what their ca capabilities are, and where lie their limits. And this is an important thing because this allows us to understand why, for example, Turkey has been zigzagging a lot uh, when it comes to the Kurdish, when, it's com when it comes to its relationship with the Kurds and Iraq in general over the past decade. Now, if uh, some of you may remember until very recently, Erdogan had very cozy uh, relations with uh, Barzani and uh, Tur Barzani could uh, come to Turkey very casually, uh, visit, uh, make visits in Ankara. Turkey served as the uh, main corridor uh, for uh, Iraqi oil, for Kurdish Iraqi oil. And Turkish companies were very active in Erbil and other towns, especially in the construction business. So Turk's reaction to the referendum is actually I mean, comes as a surprise to many who have been observing this, uh, this, this relationship unfolding in the, in the past decade or so. Um, and it, it's, it makes us cautious that, that it doesn't probably derive from some sort of ancient hatred between the Turkish leadership and the Kurdish communities and so on. The answer lies in Syria. 
Turkey learned something new in Syria, which is that the United States, its long-term ally, proved to be unreliable, even detrimental to Turkish interests in Syria. This becomes most clear when uh, Turkey, Turkey insistently requested from the US not to collaborate with the Kurds in Syria, which Turks see as an extension of Kurdish militias in Turkey. And, and it was hopeful that the US would cooperate with Turkey in taking over uh, Raqqa, for example. That didn't happen. The US leadership kindly refused and continued to arm the Kurds there, uh, which Turks read as a clear uh, rejection and clear betrayal uh, of Turkish interest in Syria. Turkey is very, um, I think Erdogan is certainly, uh, has no doubts that all those arms that have been coming into Kurdish hands in Syria will turn to Turkey once Kurds are done with their job in, in, in Syria. So when Turks look at, or when Turkish leadership, particularly Erdogan looks at uh, Iraq, he doesn't look at the Kurdish referendum as one off event, as one thing that can be uh, analyzed you know, in an isolated way. And, can be, can, uh, and, and he doesn't develop a reaction on the basis of that event only, but it, he sees this as part of a broader project or a broader process through which an interconnected Kurdish political geography uh, is to be created. And and if, if, if Kurds in Syria were not armed by the US, Turkey would not have any problem with this project either. Just as for years, Turkey did not have bad relations with Israel. And Turkey had a long, you know, for, have, had, had been working with the US uh, for decades during the Cold War and after. But the, the fallout with the, with the US and Syria taught Turks a, a significant lesson and basically that's what drives them to come closer to Iran. And it's not very surprising that the Kerkuk Kirk operation came right after the mutual visits between uh, Iran and Turkey on the level of chief of staff and, and, and the president. Um, now, where do the Russians stand? Russians actually do not care so much about Iraq uh, as they do about Syria, but now they have an interest in not losing uh, a, slowly developing good relations with Turkey and uh, his, uh, its alliance with, with Iran. Because uh, these, these three powers have been in conflict uh, for, for decades by now. And mostly from, but through the conflicts that have been stirred up by powers across the Atlantic. And so there is a convergence now and a broader understanding that they have uh, these old territorial powers have a lot of, uh, could benefit a lot if they move in consensus and do not allow these conflicts to spread out. The, they have lessons to learn from Syria, the Crimea, the Caucasus, and so on. They never win. And so, as they come together, this non-Arab triangle, if you like, in the north of the Middle East, they are likely to play an important key role in the affairs of the Middle East. And because these are all territorial powers, they know how to operate in the frontiers with small, making small moves, uh, aligning with, uh, uh, with, with networks across their borders, and resolving issues without necessarily going in and bombing like the US does most often. And so we see now uh, the region roughly divided between Russia, Iran, and Turkey in the north, and uh, maybe a US alliance in the south, mostly squeezed in the GCC countries. And um, it, if I have to come back to the question of whether there will be a war or not, I think with these powers around Iraq and with a consensus, uh, the only exit that the the Kurdish, uh, pop, Kurdish uh, Iraqi Kurds have is, is the US and Israel. And without them being involved directly on the ground, Kurds will not be able to uh, operate as they want. And if, if the US or Israel 
decide to go in, they will create another mess. I don't think they will, they will, they will like that either. So, uh, so I don't think the good thing probably that there is this uh, uh, northern alliance coming about is that we are, we are, it's we are unlikely to see uh, huge wars uh, in the region like we had in Syria. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sir Kant. Uh, thanks also again for um, giving us a projection of what you see may or may not happen in the future and for basing that projection on the analysis you have given us. I think one thing which Sir Khan has shown us is this region as something like a chessboard in which the long-standing players like Russia, Iran, and Turkey are able to move pieces on the chessboard. These pieces may include troops, may include guns, may include um, uh, diasporic populations, but they have a certain uh, on the ground concrete presence and ability to manipulate pieces in order to shape shape the region. And, and part of the discussion which we will have today, I think will involve these different countries shaping together the region with their individuals, with their, each of their set of, of, of pieces. And I think it's quite interesting also that uh, Sir Khan brought in the US. I think the US does not play this sort of chess, at least in the Middle East, because the US generally plays from 30,000 feet uh, with bombs and so on, or with a large military push, say, into Iraq with 130,000 troops, and then pulls back. But this sort of more on-the-ground chessboard micro thing the US doesn't do. So I think um, um, while Condoleezza Rice said that democracy is messy, US goes in to make a big mess, I think the US, I always say, doesn't clean up after its mess. And so in a way, perhaps we can see that this is maybe part of the process of cleaning up that mess. And in that cleaning up, perhaps we see a new order taking place, a new order which may not be that different in the process of its shaping from how the old orders were shaped. The, the story Sir Khan uh, started out with of the Russians, the Turks, and the Iranians having these little states um, in the backyards of their neighbors. So I think this sort of view is, is very useful. Uh, we have Dr. Ahmad Hashim. Okay, thank you very much, Professor. Um, I'm going to be talking about the feasibility of Kurdish uh, um, independence or self-determination from two perspectives, uh, international law perspective uh, and theories of state formation, and what we call the reality or realism, power politics, uh, geopolitics, um, domestic, international, uh, and also the issue of agency, uh, the role of uh, um, elites in the formulation of uh, the uh, path towards uh, independence. And you know, of course, the Kurds have uh, always overreached in uh, history, um, in Iran and Iraq, uh, and that has cost them a lot. And the question is whether they're overreaching now uh, with the referendum. But there, of course, there were many factors behind this. But looking at it in terms of international law, the Kurds know that uh, realism um, has been very important in uh, furthering or hindering their path towards independence. But their government does have, has developed over the, time, over the course of their uh, liberation, so to speak, from Saddam's uh, clutches in uh, 1991, and then after the fratricidal civil war that uh, the KDP and PUK fought, they started building instruments of government and also an international legal department to look at uh, the, uh, uh, the int legal justifications for Kurdish statehood, and you find this being uh, used quite uh, a lot by Kurdish officials. Now, it, you know, we've had in recent times, and the Kurds have pointed to this, uh, independence in East Timor, Kosovo, and South Sudan. And for them, the issue of, uh, uh, obviously, because um, it's closer in a sense, is the issue of South Sudan and Kosovo. Kosovo was recognized by 77 countries, which is one of the indications of statehood uh, theories, uh, the, the different theories that stem out of the Montevideo Convention on what is a state as an international legal uh, person. But one of them is that recognition, uh, uh, the declarative or declaratory theory. There's another, uh, there's 
another theory which says it doesn't matter whether you're recognized or not, but that makes for a very murky uh, existence of a state. You know, ISIS uh, declared a state, but nobody recognized it uh, over the course of its short, mercifully short existence. But international po uh, politics is not mediated uh, uh, in an ideal world, world, rather it's through power politics, geopolitics, and as I said, agency. The Kurds are the largest nation uh, in the world without a state. And this, of course, has been uh, an issue for them. They do not, and I agree with uh, Fanaria, I guess we both have a very uh, close uh, uh, understanding of the situation on the ground in Iraq. I have been to Iraq, and the Kurds just do not wish to remain. But the issue which is fascinating is if the periphery no longer wants to remain, within a state, you also have to have the sentiment within the center, by the grace of God, go. And I actually, you know, uh, if you look at the issue of Sudan, um, the separation between the North and South, uh, the Southerners had been fighting since 1952 uh, to achieve independence uh, after a 50 year struggle. Of course, uh, over the, uh, and the Sudan, Northern Sudan, Sudanese wanted to prevent that, but over the course of time, Notwithstanding the, the uh, presence of oil in South Sudan, there was a sentiment in the North that we want to get rid of these people. They have nothing to do with us. We don't share any culture, commonalities. Uh, Northerners uh, look towards Cairo and the Middle East in general. The South looks towards Africa. And there is, there is a quite remarkable amount of racism uh, from the North towards the South. Um, but going beyond that, it then was expressed in, please leave. And so I don't know if that sentiment has hit uh, uh, Iraqi Arabs yet, but I actually um, would disagree a little bit with you because in my time in Iraq, I noticed some Iraqi Arabs saying, you know, they can go and take what is due to them and not a penny or territory more. This was what an Iraqi army officer in Mosul told me. He said, we know, and he was pointing sort of uh, eastward, we know they want independence, and they're doing it by stealth. And, you know, uh, they can go, just leave, because they have been nothing but essentially, and this is a remarkable, um, you know, Tabur Khamis, a fifth column within Iraq that has been used by other regional powers and international powers to weaken Iraq. So it's better if they become independent and a friendly neighbor. So that follows your argument that, you know, if the Kurds become an independent state, and we're talking here about the Kurds in Iraq, not the, uh, I'm not reaching out into the uh, uh, Turkish situation or the Iranian issue, and both of them have problems with Kurds and fears of unraveling that, you know, what the Chinese refer to as splitism um, also affects uh, potentially a country like Iran, which has Azeris, Kurds, and Baluchis, who've been, uh, uh, rather uh, uh, disgruntled, and Arabs in Khuzestan, um, who've also been disgruntled. So the, there's the issue of um, international law. Now, the issue about international law is funny. The UN Charter and subsequent resolutions have never really been ambiguously in fa favor of uh, self-determining. This is, um, most people don't follow this very carefully because it's all, of course, all legalese that bores the hell out of a lot of people, basically. But there is a juxtaposition which the UN has never really resolved. In many of its charter uh, uh, resolutions, look at the principles. Every people has the right to self-determination. But country, and let me quote from one of them, which I, I have in the chapter that I'm working on, um, on a book on Iraq. The subjugation of peoples to alien Subjugation, domination, and exploitation constitutes a fundamental denial of rights. Any attempt aimed at the partial or total disruption of the national unity and territorial integrity of a country is incompatible with the purposes and principles of the Charter of the UN. So yes, you have the right to self-determination, but it's not good for states to break up. So here, there, there has never really been a full-fledged, uh, um, uh, you know, coming, it's a sitting on the fence. So for example, the incongruous situation of in the Congo in the 1960s where the UN supported 
the Congo's independence from Belgium, but sent troops to prevent the secession of Katanga from the Congo. Okay, so as I said, international law has all these uh, contradictions within them. So f a lot of Kurds actually believe it's the real world. And of course, having suffered uh, uh, in, in terms of the, uh, of the uh, coercive power of more powerful states, the real world has been where they have functioned um, most uh, effectively. Uh, well, not effectively. They have functioned within the real world rather than the ideal world of international law. And functioning within the real world, they have also made serious mistakes in terms of overreaching and not understanding the coercive power of, of the state of three powerful countries in the region. However much Iraq may have collapsed in 2014, however inept uh, all three countries have fought the Kurds over the course of their history, the coercive power of those three states is far more than what the Peshmerga have ever uh, achieved. Now, let me put it this way, and as I am following Fanar again, the American media view of the Kurds fighting, uh, and of course the bad episode of the Republic of Mahabad because they were bloody communists, so forget them, but then somehow Mullah Mustafa Barzani, who had met Stalin, was transmogrified into a national liberation leader in the 1960s when he fought against uh, Abdul Karim Qasim, who, horror of horrors, at the time of uh, the, anti the Red Scare, um, suddenly he's become a national liberation leader, and the Peshmerga are these fabulous guerrilla fighters that never get defeated. The fact is, on the plains, they were invariably defeated by the Iraqi army. For the simple fact is you have a conventional force against a lightly armed guerrilla force. As soon as they went into the mountains, the tide, the uh, table turned, and they would inflict immense casualties on Iraqi forces, especially on the conscripts, the, uh, the infantry conscripts from the Shia towns of the south, which contributed also to that anti baathist rising in 1977 as a result of the massive casual uh, uh, because the war had ended in 75, but the casualties uh, were you know, essentially uncovered among infantry, among commandos, and the Shia bore the bulk of that. So if you go to the issue of Kurdish independence and so on, the Kurds often took advantage of weakening of the powers around them to enlarge their a strategic maneuver, uh, capacity for maneuver, or to go into rebellion. So for example, when Abdel Karim Qasim was facing problems with the na Arab nationalist, Barzani launched a rebellion. Um, when the Ba'athists were facing problems in Iraq, they launched a rebellion supported by the Shah of Iran and by uh, uh, a man you would all know about, Henry Kissinger, who promoted the support for the, for the Kurds. The problem is Barzani made a, a major mistake here. The Shah wasn't fighting, wasn't supporting the Kurds to overthrow the Ba'ath regime. He was trying to control them and get them to reach a modus vivendi on the Shat al-Arab and, and to forego uh, making uh, problems uh, uh, in the Persian Gulf in terms of supporting radical movements and so on. And once they reached that modus vivendi, the Iranian troops left. And this was a disaster for the Kurds. They overreached again. Now, of course, some of their overreaching is really not sort of like a genetic thing. Is you, make, you take a risk, you've made, you make a mistake. Everybody thought that Saddam was going to be overthrown in 1991. He, he lost control of a, a lot of provinces in Iraq, and the Shia were up in arms. And the Kurds took advantage of that, resulting, of course, in the uh, uh, problems they faced much later on. Now, if you, look, if you go even uh, further back to the, not that much, but in the Iran-Iraq war, Talibani took advantage of Iraq's problems and overstretched forces to launch a, essentially, de facto ally himself with the uh, Iranians, um, particularly in the northern sector of Iraq. And he actually said in 1987, when the Iranians seemed ver on the verge of victory, it is time for Iraq, and I have this quote somewhere in the book that I'm writing, 
is established, and this is the man who became president of Iraq, it is time for Iraq to break up into its three constitutive elements. Okay, so they've done that. So now moving, you know, and of course I'm going to, you know, run out of time, um, but moving forward to the current crisis, and I really want to focus on this, because as I said, a juxtaposition between international law supporting uh, Kurdish independence is established in the sense that, you know, they have a state, they have, uh, they have um, institutions, they have territory, they have uh, population, they've even established consular relations with a lot of uh, um, uh, various countries, including Turkey, which has, of course, downgraded its relations to some extent from the uh, bromance of 2006 to 2013, essentially. But it's facts on the ground, and the Kurds tried to create facts on the ground in 2014, like uh, um, certain other countries do um, throughout the world, including the Middle East. And here they overreached. They overreached by attacking Iraq at its weakest. When there was a high sense of humiliation at the loss to ISIS, the collapse of four divisions, um, the sense of siege that was felt by Iraqis, whether uh, Sunni or Shia, as a result of ISIS, and the fact that the Kurds were doing this land grab, which had a traumatic impact on Baghdad, this adding almost 50% to the te Kurdish territory. And there was a parallel argument. Yeah, they're doing something like their only regional ally does. Okay? Um, they're pointing, obviously, to another Middle Eastern country. Uh, so, and the notion in Iraq was that we're not going to allow this to stand. Once we deal with ISIS, we're going to deal with this Kurdish land grab. And even this Kurdish land grab in 2014 caused some unease among Kurds who said, you know, even though people like Mas'ud and others said, you know what, you know, we will negotiate with, uh, with Baghdad about some of this territory. There's certain other territories like Kirkuk that we will not negotiate about. This is eternally ours. Now, the Kurdish Peshmerga had problems as well uh, in fighting ISIS because the Kurdish Peshmerga is not a unified military force. It's essentially a checkpoint army. The Kurds who fought in 2014 had not fought since the 1990s. They played a minor role in the Iraq invasion of Iraq by the United States. They had not created a unified army. There was the PUK, there was the KDP army. They acquired a lot of Soviet era Iraqi junk when the Iraqi army collapsed. Most of the Iraqi weapons that, uh, um, uh, that were uh, captured in 2014 were captured by IS, not the Peshmerga. So the Peshmerga had all these weaponry that they e couldn't even use effectively, notwithstanding their antiquity, because they didn't have a command and control system. They didn't have a proper logistics system to push forward the weapons and the uh, ammun ammunition and the food and all to the Peshmerga fighting ISIS. So they collapsed. They lost in, some, uh, uh, in uh, the first few months of the fight about 1,000 dead and 38th hundred wounded. And this, of course, caused a, a, a severe um, uh, collapse of morale because there was also major corruption within the Peshmerga. A lot of the older officers <coughs> had gotten involved in the so-called import-export businesses that had sprung up in uh, Kurdistan after the opening with Turkey and Iran. So they spent most of their time actually engaged in the smuggling import-export import, business and ignoring their uh, uh, soldiers, their prof uh, f professional training, and so on. So the Peshmerga were not that vaunted force that everybody made out to be. So it's not going to be by war that they're going to reverse or try to stem the Iraqi. Because you say, OK, yeah, but isn't this a, a war right now between the inept versus the incompetent? You know, the inept being the Iraqis and the incompetent being the Kurdish Peshmerga. Much has happened in the Iraqi army between 2014 and the present to change the situation. It's been rearmed, retrained, and, now, and, and it has an air force as well. 
of, uh, uh, which the Kurds don't. They have four Chinook helicopters and four light helicopters. And they can conduct, courtesy of uh, Western and Turkish help, what we call um, forward air control assaults on enemy positions. That means pilots on the ground guiding the Air Force to hit the enemy and not their own troops. They were never able to do that under the Soviet era. They can actually move forward as they hit their enemy because the Air Force is doing it for them. Much of the Kurdish effectiveness from 2015 to the end of ISIS came from coalition airstrikes which were forward air controlled by American, French, and British, and German uh, pilots on the ground helping the Kurds move forward. And of course, the Kurds have improved, but they don't have the military capacity. And if you add the fact that they've majorly overstretched, and it only needs to take Turkey and Iran to move troops on the border or threaten them for them to have to defend way too much. They don't have the firepower to deal with the Iraqi army and the popular mobilization units. So why did Barzani do this? And I'll, do I have a few more yes, yes. Why did Barzani the, trigger this crisis? September 25, 2017 referendum um, um, that was held. So first of all, and I think you know when we look at the situation, as uh, Fanar said, you have to look at the domestic in Baghdad, domestic in Erbil, the, re uh, the countrywide, the regional, uh, the international. I believe that the Kurdish political and socioeconomic crisis was a factor. For many years, the Kurds wanted to tell everybody else that Kurdistan was the other Iraq, stable, prosperous, developing, and progressive, or that, and, and this is a very mirthful, uh, it was the Switzerland of the Middle East, okay? I've been to both, par uh, both countries, and Kurdistan is not Switzerland. Um, and, but of course, compared to the horrors that were happening in the rest of Iraq, this was a stable Pacific area, so to speak. But nonetheless, they have faced, as Kobat Talibani said, from 2014 to the present, a crisis, as he put it, of staggering proportions, political and socioeconomic. Beginning in 2014, an economic tsunami occurred in four areas. The Iraqi government slashed the KRG's share of the federal budget. War with ISIS led to a massive increase in security and military expenditures. And interestingly enough, much of this massive increase was wasteful duplicative and was corrupt. Duplicative because it went into two different Peshmerga forces when you didn't need that. <clears throat> two million refugees came in. And finally, the massive drop in global oil prices. By 2015, they were grappling with a monthly deficit of $410 million. And they were had on their payroll $1.5 uh, million people out of a population of 5.3. The, the Kurds used to sneer at these authoritarian Arab states where you know the, sta the state is inflated, massive corruption and so on. They had the same thing. They were paying $800 million in salaries monthly from 2015 until 2016 when now they've managed to cut it. There's the corruption, the creation of super superfluous jobs villages would suddenly find themselves protected by 20 to 40 government paid village guards. This is essentially the KDP and PUK trying to create employment as for support. So one could argue with all these issues, including political nepotism and assassination of journalists, Barzani was trying to and was with the opposition Goran say, uh, and the civil society saying, you know, before we declare independence, Kurdistan needs to take care of things internally. But now with Iraq on the uh, offensive, he thought maybe if I can have this referendum, which is very uh, or, or about independence, which is very a popular issue with Kurds, maybe the popularity that I've lost can be regained. Also, this is another factor. 
If you declare independence, Kurdistan moves from an, a, a non-state entity to a state entity which will avail it of all the international agencies that can give it a bailout a la Greece that it is not entitled to right now. Kurdistan's government is actually a mess. They don't know how to deal with debt. They have a very poor accounting system. Less than 10% of the population pays taxes. The, sa the, the, the saving grace for them would be recognition as an international state. And just finally here, the other act factor was Kurdish strategic appraisal of the situation from 2014 to the present. Another overreach and a, a mistake. They dis after the defeat of the Iraqi army, they disparaged the Iraqis, thought the Iraqi army could, would, uh, uh, could not uh, do anything to them afterwards. They moved into these areas and they overestimated their military capability. And on this note, I think I've run out of time. Thank you, Dr. Ahmad Hashim, uh, for your basically very sobering view on what the Kurds have done with the referendum. Um, your, your analysis of the internal weakness and divisions, uh, I think, goes a fair bit of the way in explaining how this thing collapsed so quickly, um, but also the international side of not having recognition by your colleagues that you want to be your you want to be your colleagues, unlike Kosovo with the over seventy states. I think those two things put together uh, do paint a picture of overreach. Uh, I do think, perhaps, however, that um, there is never a good time to um, to to declare independence. There is never a good time, and few countries have the good luck of being kicked out of a state like Singapore. So I think Singapore did quite well in that. Perhaps the Kurds can uh, learn from Singapore how to get kicked out of Iraq rather than fight for independence. Uh, nevertheless, um, nevertheless, a um, um, uh, very sobering view of this. I, I do think that the, um, apart from the internal divisions and the position of um, Barzani, um, these sorts of opportunities don't come very often as well, maybe once in a hundred years since, let's say, the First World War. And so, and so perhaps there may have been a, a, a sense that, well, now is as good a time as any, since the war with uh, ISIS is almost over, but not quite yet over. Once it is over, then we will lose our uh, use for the Americans, for the Europeans. The Europeans, of course, don't like all these refugees spilling over from the Middle East. The Americans want uh, ISIS to be defeated. So now is, in a sense, the last moment. When ISIS is fully defeated, we have lost major card. Before ISIS is fully defeated, we still have a strong card to play, or they think it was, it's a strong card. And so perhaps there's a sense of a window closing. I, I don't know. So that may be part of the calculation. In any case, uh, I'd like to open up uh, questions and discussions to the floor. So please, um, yes, please start. Uh, yeah, I, I have a question for each of the speakers. Uh, the um, for Dr. Haddad, um, can you elaborate on the how, um, what is the reaction within Iraq? both uh, you know, between Sunni and Shia, and also on party political lines. Uh, and then for Dr. Yolachan, I, um, c um, could you talk a bit about uh, you know, how Russia formulates its view? Is it just that the enemy or my enemy is my friend, and because Iran is uh, you know, on one side and that's against the US, so, so how did this Russia's view come about? And also on Turkey, you mentioned about the friendly relations with Bazani, and how does that play into how they formulated their view this time? Um, and then for Dr. Hashim, I'd like to ask you the most important question, which is how does this all end? Thank you. You get the easy question, Ahmed. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
shall I? Yes, go ahead. Uh, okay, uh, this, um, I'm glad you asked this question because it ties into something I wanted to say to uh, Dr. Hashim. Uh, you mentioned uh, the, the military officer who said, you know, if only they would go, right? If only they, they, they're a parasitic uh, actor in Iraq, they're in potential fifth column, etc., etc. if only they'd go. This, I find this sentiment to have become more and more common amongst Arab Iraqis over the years, um, which is why when the referendum was called, I thought, aha, uh -huh. since it has reached, so, it's become so common to hear this point of view, I thought maybe Arab Iraqis would be receptive to the idea of the referendum, as in finally, now you can take your independence and get out of our hair. Uh, Alas, it turned out not to be the, when push came to shove, it was all talk, this idea of if only they'd leave us. Because it strikes me that if, even if they'll say it in private, and I guarantee you even politicians at the highest level say this in private, um, saying it in public is a, has proven to be another thing. The, and this is, I, 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 in my opinion, this is a bit of a legacy, like an inheritance from the 20th century Iraqi state. For all their talk, they still see themselves, the ruling classes today in Baghdad, they still see themselves as custodians of this construct called Iraq. Uh, and no one wants to be accused of being the person that facilitated the breakup of this construct. Even if privately they believe it to be a good idea for the Kurds to go their own way. Because Dr. Hashim is absolutely right. You hear this view very often. Um, but it turns out that when push comes to shove, uh, the Iraqis proved rather allergic to the idea. And the problem is, and this is why I think it's, it's all unsustainable, it reminds me of sort of a colonialist point of view. Um, for all the talk of our, our, our Kurdish brothers and our Kurdish people and all the rest of it, this is clearly sort of Baghdad stamping down its authority. Um, and it's trying to retain a population you despise. This is, this is, I find, the most paradoxical thing. The loudest voices uh, co uh, that, that condemn the Kurds, the most vociferous voices condemning the Kurds, are the most insistent that the Kurds remain within Iraq. I'm thinking of the Malikis, of the Assad, people like that. They're the, they're the least likely to consider loosening the ties, even though they're the, most, they're the loudest voices in condemning the Kurds. Uh, and it's, it's almost like, like I said, it reminds me of a colonialist sort of mindset. How long can this go? Uh, in terms of just rank and file reactions, it's pretty unanimous, sort of the, A, the rejection of the referendum, B, the jingoistic nationalism that uh, we're witnessing as the Iraqi armed forces get the upper hand on the Kurds. Teaching the Kurds a lesson is good, like very popular politics in, in, in Arab Iraq always has been, um, which again goes back to this colonial mindset that, that I mentioned. Uh, so I'd say, I'd say that's, that's, I mean, unless, did that, that answer your question or did you have a specific uh, reaction you were looking for? Oh, um, by and large, no. Uh, Sunnis are, are less likely to welcome, uh, in my opinion, a Kurdish, um, a Kurdish independence because they will become an even smaller minority and be further swamped by the Shias in, in, in what remains. And again, it show, this is the paradox. If they were thinking in terms of strategic uh, advantage, Shia politicians should be the most supportive of Kurdish independence because they'll become an absolute majority uh, in what remains of Iraq. But as I said, there is still that mindset of the unitary Iraq revolving around Baghdad and that they're the custodians of this and that they do not want to be accused of the one, as being the ones who led to its breakup. Um, about how Russia uh, formulates its foreign policy, maybe with regard to uh, the Kurds or the issues in general. Um, it has been, from the very start in the Syrian case, very firm and consistent what, what, what Russia's uh, wanted in Syria. And this was basically the keeping the, uh, retaining the outlet to the Eastern Mediterranean. That's, that was about it. And all the rest came or revolved around this this, uh, this policy. So they, for example, didn't have a very consistent policy about the Kurds in Syria. 
there were times when they uh, allowed Kurds to come and open bra uh, branches even in, in Syria at a time when uh, Turks were uh, wary of, of this, uh, this, this Kurdish development in Syria. Uh, and when, when rapprochement took place between, with, with Turkey, then they uh, put a certain distance uh, with the Kurds. So in, in the Syrian crisis, Russian uh, foreign policy or Russian policy in general is formulated or based or centered around retaining that outlet in the Eastern Mediterranean. Anything that serves that purpose uh, worked for the Russians. Whereas in Iraq, they didn't really, and, heavy, and they really don't have uh, that much stake in, in, in Iraq. It's their current formulations around uh, Iraq does not derive from what, what Turkey thinks or not, or whether uh, Turkey had, uh, whether Erdogan had good relations with, uh, with Barzani or not, but more uh, that now there is a new channel opened up between Turkey and Russia since the downing of the Russian jet in, in, in uh, 2015. And that channel is, uh, has been happening through mutual visits, but also through what has been known as the Astana process. So there has been peace talks in Astana process, there are letters uh, being exchanged and so on, and uh, Erdogan has access to what Erdogan can uh, convey his views to Putin, and Putin can do the same uh, to Erdogan in much more frequently. So there is there's less gap and there's less uh, lack of communication that used to be the case uh, up until 2015. So basically for uh, four to five years when Turkey and Russia were on the opposite camps. And Turkey was acting with the US as a long-term ally, whereas now Turkey is uh, sort of shifting uh, more toward uh, Russia and Iran. So Russian, for, Russian attitude towards what is happening in Iraq, it doesn't come from a very, uh, uh, an interest that goes back, but it, an interest in keeping this Iranian-Turkish Access alive and and vis-a-vis uh, uh, vis-a-vis vis -vis vis -vis the U.S. involvement through Iraq and Syria. Thank you. Okay, um, your, the title of your question reminds me of a book that was written about the Iraq War when uh, Petre, uh, um, Petres was being interviewed by this journalist, and um, she was ask, uh, asking questions about the future. He says, you know. Uh, tell me how this ends and he threw it back at her so it's, it's a similar process so how you know i can't predict but let me tie it also to what uh uh that said about the uh, um keeping uh, kurdistan let me take a slightly different angle with uh, from him and, and this ties into your question i think Baghdad and Iraq's Arabs want to tell the Kurds, you're not going to dictate 100% to us the parameters of your secession. Because I think there is a general sentiment that these people will go, ultimately. And hopefully that they will. But you are not going to do it through an outright victory, which includes adding 50% more to your territory. which. Mean, means you have seized. So the fracturing of Iraq, because there is an aversion in the Arab country to the notion of fracture, which they think is uh, an imperialist plot uh, brought about by the United States and Israel. And in fact, if you look at Israeli strategy in the 1980s, there was a view that, you know, if we can fracture the Arab countries, uh, I don't know how seriously the Israelis take it now, um, but the United States and Israel were the most fervent supporters of South Sudanese independence, which did not go unnoticed in the Arab world. I don't think Iraq is going to march into Kurdistan proper. It has too much uh, at stake to lose. There is, of course, the American obstacle, which is going to prevent it. They're not going to function effectively in the mountains, uh, which is where the Kurds will come into their own. And this is where the Kurd, the Peshmerga, is really masters of mountain warfare in this. They're not gonna be able to do it. Um, so I do, they're going to nibble away at all these territories that the Kurds have set, and essentially then turn around to them and say, okay, now we can negotiate about certain things. And I don't think the Kurds will try to move out of their Kurdistan proper, if you look at the, uh, the semi-defined lines, to try and retake what they've lost. They are weak, they're divided, 
the KDP is accusing the PUK of, uh, to use that German uh, word, Dolstas, stab in the back. Um, there is no unity and there is considerable amount of uh, enmity between the two elements of the Peshmerga. And I don't think anybody's going to arm them to take back what you've taken because it, it, it's not legitimate in that sense. And the Kirkuk issue, nobody's going to, you know, the Germans have withdrawn all their uh, advisors because they said, you know, uh, enough is enough. We don't want to be part of this. So I don't think, except for Israel, which will find it very hard to put troops and advisors on the ground when it is trying to mend relations with the Arab world in order to focus on Iran. Um, I don't think this is something it will do. And in any case, the Iraqi military has so much, uh, has learned so much from the people who have retrained it, uh, whether Western or Iranian, um, the Kurds will have a very hard time. And I think basically Baghdad is using military maneuvering and victories to turn to the Kurds and say, okay, what now? Let's discuss. At the same time, trying to create more divisions between the KDP and PUK, which is not surprising. It's part of international relations. The Kurds did it uh, when they were seemingly at their uh, zenith, when they told the Sunni Arabs of Nineveh, you know, you don't go back to uh, uh, those uh, homicidal Shia in Baghdad, be part of Kurdistan. And they actually seduced some Arab tribes to thinking this is where their future would be. But now with Kurdistan embittered, it does not want Arabs in Kurdistan. And this basically, uh, you know, they will, they, there will be discussions about the two million Arab refugees and Yazidis and others, wh what to do with them. There will be discussions, in my view, after this, because I think both sides are exhausted. And the Kurds, you know, as I basically uh, have said um, before, the Kurds never miss an opportunity to avail themselves of overreaching. Um, and my uh, concern here is that Baghdad doesn't do the same. <laughs> Reminds me of what the Israelis say about Palestinians. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They never miss a chance to mess up. Um, question? Uh, I'm Venkatesh from the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. I want to thank the panel for your insightful analysis. So I have two questions. Number one, as I understand, um, Kurdistan has six largest oil reserves in the world, and there was an agreement between the Iraqi government and Kurdistan about 17% of the budget being given in exchange for the oil reserves. So why did the Iraqi government back out from that? That is number one. And second, what's stopping the Kurds from the neighboring states of Syria, uh, Turkey, and uh, I Iran to form a grand alliance and help the uh, Kurdistan to uh, win back its uh, help in the referendum and uh, thereafter? Thank you. Well, the second one is the easier one. Uh, I mean, as as we just heard uh, from Dr. Hashem about the, how, how chronically divided the Kurds in, in Iraq are, um, asking for a grand, greater Kurdistan unity, I think, is, might be a bridge too far. The Kurds are divided linguistically, they're divided tribally, they're divided regionally. The experience of the nation state has also impacted their respective political outlooks, political visions. Uh, you've got organizations like the PKK, which are, you know, like a, a cult, uh, essentially. There's no room for sort of real cooperation or, or real unity uh, with the KDP, for example. Um, the KDP can't even, can't even uh, sort its own house out uh, uh, with regards to the PUK and Goran. So that sort of grand unity is not going to happen. And as I said, they, they, they're also their political horizons and their political vision is very different. The Kurds in, in Turkey have a very different political goal, the, the political horizon, than is the case with Kurds in the Kurdish region of Iraq, or indeed in Rojava in, uh, in, uh, uh, in Syria. Uh, I mean, it's very abstract, this talk of greater Kurdistan, like one country encompassing all, um, more sort of the stuff of diaspora rather than what people on the ground are, are aiming for. Uh, as for the oil sharing agreement, that is continuously, I mean, it's not the first time it, it breaks down. I think the breakdown uh, was about 2015 or thereabouts. Um, now, you said the Kur Kurdish region has the sixth largest oil reserve in the world. That's contentious because 
where the borders, what borders are you drawing? Because the Kirkuk and its oil is part of the disputed territories. Uh, so there's all this uh, like the legal nitty gritty as to when the constitution says um, uh, existing oil wells, does that mean already tapped? Or does it mean uh, any, oil, any oil reserves tapped or untapped belong to the region? Baghdad and Erbil differ on that. Uh, so this is one of the things that need to be negotiated. Um, and again, I'll bring it back, you know, I, I agree with you that now, I think now, Baghdad will negotiate from a position of strength. But they'll, they'll, they'll negotiate around autonomy rather than secession. I still don't think they have the courage to, even though, the, even though most, most Iraqi politicians agree that at one point or another, the Kurdish region will go its own way, I think they all think, yeah, but not on my watch. They'll go on their way, but it's just let it happen after I leave office. Um, so this is this oil issue is one of the many issues that need to be ironed out, and I think now they will they will sort of uh, uh, negotiate from a position of strength. Are there any priority of issues on the Kurdish side? Reef, natural resources. I mean, guys, jump in if I miss something. Uh, natural resources, uh, revenue sharing, borders. Uh, these I think are the most important. Then there's the issue of the population transfers that have happened, uh, which goes back into borders. This area, is it an Arab area or is it a Kurdish area? Yes, but there was a population transfer back in the 70s. Oh, but there was another one in the last five years, et cetera, et cetera. Indeed, in a place like Tos Kormata, there was a population transfer last week. Yeah. So uh, it's, it's a bound, I'd say about boundaries, uh, loosely defined, and uh, a revenue sharing and natural resources. These are, I think, the most important. Thank you. Any questions? Yes, please. Uh, Hello, my name is Roman. I'm also from LQI school. And uh, Kurdistan is a landlocked place, basically. And right now, it's highly depending on delivery of goods from other sides. Basically, the countries that are now threatening to blockade the Kurdistan, and just just in that case. So, uh, as I understand, like uh, the military option, some kind of a is on the table, but why uh, are they really going to blockade Kurdistan? Like in this sense, I mean, the countries like Turkey, Iraq, Iran, or something in it that is case. It's essentially blockaded right now. That's just all the flights from Middle Eastern countries, and uh, um, I think some of the European countries have also s stopped their flights, and t uh, Turkey, uh, UAE. Uh, and, and so on. So the flights have been suspended, and Baghdad has taken control over a lot of the uh, border crossing posts and has told countries, and has put troops and uh, federal police there, and have basically told countries that you deal with us, and any oil company or anything has to deal with Baghdad uh, from now on. So uh, Kurdistan, as I said, one of the factors of overreaching was not understanding that when the Iraqis, when they did this referendum, nobody on their border was going to have a positive attitude mm -hmm. and that the Iraqis were not as weak as 2014. So that's what I find mind-boggling because now with the recriminations that have started, you see Kurds like the Goran people in the PUK and others. Um, there's a very small minority of Kurds who say, let's stay within a federal Iraq because it's better to be part of a bigger country and not be bullied by others. But a lot of Kurds, as I said, have actually argued our path was towards what, uh, what I refer to as a salami tactic of stealthy independence, de, de facto independence. Until such time, in f a few years' time, we will be able to get international de jure independence without uh, a war or anything. We will have established ourselves. So people like, uh, after the debacle with the loss of Kirkuk, People turned and said, you see, uh, Barzani, you, you had uh, delusions of grandeur, uh, or maybe delusions of adequacy, I don't know. And basically <laughs> what you've done is you've overreached and have overthrown our path, our salami tactic path, which was working. We, we still don't have the full institutions, they argue. So why was this? Referendum, which, you know, we want independence, except for personal aggrandizement, and yet another misreading of the strategic environment. Uh, 
Uh, and the last question, like the, the ground they actually uh, now Peshmerga is located like this with the territories you were talking about. Uh, I was viewing it as like Kurds trying to get additional leverage on their negotiation with the central government in like case of autonomy or something. Wasn't it them, that, that kind of a movement, not just a land grab or something because the like... Referendum? No, no, no. Uh, I mean when Peshmerga moved to like other territories and to using the, these territories as uh, kind of a leverage for to negotiate better terms with the central government. So, like, but I don't know. But I don't think on Kirkuk. So they might have. So I, I increased my territory by forty percent. Fine, that gives me a lot of things I can negotiate with. As in, I'll give you this, I'll give you that. But I don't think they would have negotiated on Kirkuk. They would. They, they, as far as they saw it, in my opinion. Uh, they established facts on the ground in 2014 by taking control of Kirkuk. Uh, so everything else becomes up for negotiation. I'll give you everything else, but I'm keeping Kirkuk. At the very minimum, I think they, they would not have given up on Kirkuk. Uh, and what about like central Iraqi government? Are they also, like Kirkuk seems to be a very, this kind of a, uh, main cause of problems between. Yeah, and there's, it's, in the referendum, uh, beg your pardon, in the uh, Constitution of 2005, Article 140 is supposed to address this. The idea is a three-stage process. Again, please jump in someone if I forget something. Uh, normalization is the first step, which means sorting out the legacy of population transfers. So you and your family were kicked out of Kirkuk through the process of normalization. We can bring you back in, etc. Uh, then a census would take place. And then a referendum would take place to decide the fate of Kirkuk. None of these has happened, none of them, right? And I don't think they will happen. Uh, one thing we should say here, when we, when we talk about constitution and legality and all, I did mention that Baghdad is well within its constitutional right to uh, deploy troops in certain areas provided they don't cross the line that I, that I displayed in the PowerPoint. However, the Constitution is extremely flawed. A lot of the problems that have emerged are because of constitutional ambiguity, because of a lack of, uh, the Constitution was, is not the most thought out legal document uh, out there. It was, it was drafted in less than six months. Um, as uh, someone pointed out, a legal scholar pointed out, post-apartheid South Africa's uh, Constitution took about seven years to draft. Iraq rushed it through because it was done according to a, the American occupation's uh, time frame in less than six months. Uh, it's a deeply flawed document. Uh, the Constitution will not be able, resorting to the Constitution will not solve this, is what I'm saying. So you don't feel really pop, like optimistic about the future of Kirkuk? resolution of Kirkuk issue? Not, not at the moment. Uh, I think because, and the other thing is I fear that Baghdad will the position of strength that they're creating, I, maybe I'm being unfair, but my gut tells me the position of strength that they're creating will be misused. It's more likely to be abused rather than be used in a magnanimous way to forge a mutually beneficial future. In, but I hope I'm wrong. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Oh, I have a question for the panel. Um, We've heard uh, a number of views and a number of positions of the various parties in the region. We haven't really heard about Iran. Um, according to news reports, uh, General Qasim Soleimani was in Kirkuk and cut a deal with the, um, I guess, the widow of Talibani or their, their, their grouping and um, put some troops in um, south of Kirkuk and basically said, well, you, we can do it two ways. You can um, fight with us and we'll uh, do what we can do to you, or you can um, split off and um, fold your cards, and apparently that's what happened. And in a sense, it was a very clean deal with not that much uh, fighting and so on. And so, so if that was what happened, then uh, the role of Iran was perhaps uh, not that bad a role. Um, but the larger question for the panel is, um, I see that with each crisis, with each event, you see the Russians, you see the Turks, you see the Iranians, um, you could say, advancing the agenda. And among the three of them, 
learning to deal with each other more ever and ever more closely. And uh, so with this dynamic, it seems to me that the uh, American retreat since Obama continues. Uh, and so if we put Iraq together with Syria, where indeed I think the Russians and the Iranians have won, the Americans have lost, the uh, Saudis have lost, then are we seeing a process, process of region building or rebuilding, which is more or less uh, in the hands of these three regional medium powers, the Russians, the Turks, and the Iranians, is an order shaping up in the Middle East without much American involvement, with the involvement of these three powers, these three regional powers? Well, um, I, I guess we it somehow ignored Iran in all of this, and we know that it played a big role training the PMUs, the, uh, the Iraqi uh, militias. And initially, uh, when they started, they weren't very good, but uh, the Iranian advisors, we weren't just the Revolutionary Guards and the Quds Force, but also came from the uh, Special Operations Forces. Um, uh, they <coughs> have helped transform this into a more effective fighting force. Um, the Ira Iraqi government, however, has held back from allowing too much Iranian involvement with the Iraqi army, the regular army. And that has to do with American sensitivities. Um, but you're right about Qasem Soleimani basically telling the Kurds um, that uh, we can do this the easy way or the hard way. And, and one Kurdish commander who retreated from Kirkuk said, we were totally outmaneuvered. Uh, we the firepower arrayed against us was enormous. We had no chance. And then, you know, what's the point of dying for, for Kirkuk when three powers, meaning Iraq, uh, Turkey, and Iran, have decided that they were going to uh, squeeze us? So that was the best thing to do. And, and of course, PUK units did it more readily than KDP is the, uh, um, uh, um, the uh, view right now in uh, Kurdistan. Um, Iran's role is, as I said, very important. Turkey's role with the Iraqi army has not been fully uh, uh, uncovered, um, but some people believe it's more extensive. So you see the sort of Saudi-American-Israeli uh, counter-alliance trying to uh, move against what they see as, and it's not a Turco-Iranian-Russian alliance. It's more like a de facto uh, meeting of, uh, um, idea, so to speak, because the Iranians at one point were quite uh, disturbed by the growing Russian role in Syria. And so they actually increased theirs because, as they put it, we're not going to allow the Russians to dictate everything on the ground uh, at our expense in Syria. This is a, a major strategic factor for Iran. But you see a, uh, the, you know, part of this attempt to uh, get Shia Iraq, uh, Shia dominated Iraq more uh, into more friendly relations with the Sunni Arab countries may be part of this attempt to uh, lessen the uh, impact primarily of, in Iraq, obviously, of Iranian mischief making as they see it. Thank you. Um, the, the impression uh, that we usually have of these three powers in the region is that they have been in rivalry in the uh, recent years is, uh, is, is wrong, partly because uh, these powers, maybe with the exception of the Turkish-Russian crisis over the downing of the Russian jet, uh, is despite the ideological and political differences these countries have, uh, and even when they have open conflicts, they have learned over uh, centuries how to continue trade, even in such conditions. So um, we you know, found out uh, in 2012 and 13 that there was a major uh, trade between Iran and uh, Turkey, gold for gas, uh, operating mostly under the shadow of uh, international law. Uh, and we know that despite the fact that Turkey ate into a dying Soviet Union 
uh, in the 1990s in the Caucasus and Central Asia, they emerged as big trade partners in the 2000s, even as they had competing maybe Turkish Neo Ottoman and Russian Neo Eurasianist uh, projects. Uh, natural gas, com gas com comes to Turkey and agricultural products move in the other direction. Uh, Russian tourists uh, replace Germans and the, Briti uh, and, and the Brits as the uh, number one uh, uh, tourists in Turkey. And um, Turkish companies, uh, the Russia basically was visa-free for tourists and uh, uh, businessmen from Turkey who went there, married, and establish uh, a lot of companies in, in uh, particularly in, the, in construction. So when the Russian jet was uh, downed in uh, over Syria by, by the Turkish officers, who are, by the way, uh, now in jail uh, because of their alleged uh, connections to the Gulen uh, community, uh, who are said to be behind the, the coup d'etat in 2016, uh, Turkish-Russian relations uh, in that way were very warm. Same goes for Turkey, Iran, and Iran and uh, Russia. That extends uh, to the, uh, for example, Iran-Iraq war in the past, even further on uh, in, in terms of Russia and Iran to, um, uh, to the, um, um, the Iran-Iraq war, and then uh, in the case of Russia and Turkey to the uh, 30s and 40s when, they, when uh, the Soviet and uh, Turks were kind of collaborating in state centralization uh, uh, and economic plans. So there is this uh, uh, 20th century story of these powers uh, working together, uh, even when, you know, uh, economically, even when they have political conflicts. So it is against this backdrop that we should understand how they would uh, not want to lose this sort of consensus that they are uh, coming to slowly uh, on any issue. So in, you know, regardless of uh, what is gonna happen in Syria and Iraq, I don't think they will put this, this sort of configuration at risk, uh, and which means that they may have uh, small issues or differences of opinion in the case of Syria with you know, Iran and, uh, and Russia. They will, they're unlikely to bring it, to, or escalate it to the point where they cannot work together. They, I think we've, we've all passed that point, and now with the Astana process in uh, place and Turkey, Russia, and Iran acting more or less in consensus in Syria, we, we see the benefits of that uh, already uh, on the ground. I think, I think you may be right, uh, Professor, that, that there is a, some sort of uh, an order. This is not a bloc that will play a role in global politics, but an interdependent uh, you know, a co coalition of interdependent uh, countries that will uh, play together uh, in the region. Mm. Interesting. So you think there will be a, you could say, a concert of the Middle East, like the concert of Europe uh, taking shape? Oh, no. uh, hmm, it's interesting. <laughs> um, I mean, it sort, of, it sort of sounds like, based from what was said, that there is this sort of ecosystem between these three, three powers and that there's a lot of shared interests, vital interests between the three, but that doesn't get in the way of rivalry. So the question is, if we fall out, uh, we can fall out over issue A or B or C, mm -hmm. but the vital interests are above that. And that sort of reminds me of, for all the bitterness that uh, underlines the Gulf crisis at the moment, uh, Qatar and the United Arab Emirates, the flow of gas is not uninterrupted, despite that being as poisonous a divide as it has been, that vital interest has remained. So is it a case, I wonder, that these three powers just have far more shared vital interests than the gas line between Qatar and, and uh, the Emirates? Uh, and that hence there's an ever increasing number of, of uh, interdependence that will forever be above whatever rivalry plays out between the three, because the three are not a united bloc. They, they will be at cross purposes at some times. So that's There's more, so I'm posing a question to the panel, I suppose. Uh, one thing, can, can I say one quick thing? Uh, it, the case uh, that could really eliminate this is, is, the, is the conflict in Crimea, uh, I mean, the, the Ukrainian crisis overall. Uh, normally what, would expect, uh, what we would expect from a country like Turkey in a crisis uh, in, in Ukraine, where NATO is kind of facing, you know, uh, of uh, the Russians, is that Turkey kind of had a, a very obvious, uh, 
you know, choosing the side of the Ukrainian government and acting uh, with Europe and so on. Turkey could not do it. It was caught in between, and it and it, it was harmful. The crisis was harmful from the beginning to the end because Turkey had uh, visa-free travel to both countries, and both countries <coughs> have uh, visa-free uh, travel to Turkey. And the business ties are often uh, happening in a triangle. So people who go to Ukraine have connections in Moscow, Moscow in, in Istanbul, and so on and so forth. So a crisis like that, Turkey, first of all, doesn't know how to deal with it because it's caught in between, because Nerd Turkey as a NATO member cannot uh, come to the Russian side in an obvious way. But also, Turkey is, has not much to gain from such a crisis, either militarily or, or business-wise. And so any time there's a conflict happening, a similar crisis happened with the Russian invasion in Northern Caucasus, Turkey could, you know, did not know what to do in the same way. So these sorts of crises that are happening on a more larger scale or global scale reminds each time to these powers that they are they have nothing to gain from such conflicts so they are they try to you know s smooth out the differences and sort of come together uh, uh, and at least not come to a complete fallout over over that crisis Crimea is, is a case in point and I think it's going to be the same in, in, in Syria and Iraq although Turkey seems to have uh, well not a complete fallout but fallen out with the Americans so it's almost like this has come at the expense of all the way of doing things, which was more America-centric. The U.S. is uh, is far away. I think it's a new thing happening, uh, and I think that, you know people read this in, in different ways. Uh, but if there's anything good about it, is that playing with your neighbors, and these are your neighbors, and you you will have to live with them. <laughs> uh, the U.S. is far away, and it only comes when it fits its interests, uh, and it comes in in a very certain way uh, we know how it how it does and and it always went when you know it invaded Iraq it, it was never uh, there was nothing positive that came out of it uh, in from the perspective of Turkey so uh, learning how to play with Russia and Iran in the region in the long run is is, is something that Turkey needs to cultivate and nourish than uh, putting all the eggs in one basket, which is the U.S., and it is a new thing, and it has to do with uh, the coup d'état, which, which is another uh, mm -hmm. subject altogether. Thank you, Surkan. Uh, I think we are done. Excellent discussion and presentation and Q&A. Thank you so much to our panelists. Uh, I'm quite impressed that there's so much knowledge of this far region in Singapore. And uh, thank you for your uh, probing questions and uh, attendance today. <laughs>